A British Challenger II battle tank has been destroyed by enemy fire for the first time in Ukraine. My name is Jerome Starkey, I'm the defence editor for The Sun newspaper and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news from the war in Ukraine. We'll be talking about a few things today. Firstly, the destruction of a British Challenger II tank. We'll be looking at the meeting between Vladimir Putin and North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. We'll be talking about the resignation of Ukraine's defence minister and the apparent demise of Russia's Wagner Group. To start with, a Challenger 2 tank has been destroyed near Robotny in the southern central front line, which is the focus of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Footage emerged today of a tank on fire, flames and smoke billowing from the wreckage of a damaged hull, filmed by Ukrainian soldiers as they drove past in a state of panic. Now, we understand that the tank was hit by some form of projectile rather than an anti-tank mine, but exactly what destroyed it at this stage still remains unclear. Defence sources insisting, however, that the crew on board have all survived. It's significant because it is the first time that we've seen these Challenger 2 tanks in action in Ukraine, and it's also significant because this is the first time in the history of the Challenger 2 that it has been destroyed in battle by enemy fire. The only other time that a British Challenger 2 tank has suffered what is known as a K kill, a full kill of the vehicle, was in the Iraq War in 2003 when a British Challenger was hit by a second Challenger in a friendly fire incident that left two British soldiers dead and two others seriously wounded. Now, what this shows. Uh, in terms of the war in Ukraine is that Ukraine is does appear to be going all in in the Battle of Robotny. This is where they've been making their big push to try and break through Russia's very well-built, well-defended main front line. It's part of a main effort to push southwards through Zaporizhia province towards the Sea of Azov, and that's about trying to cut Russian supply lines from mainland Russia to occupied Crimea. Now, that offensive, as we well know, has not been going as fast as Ukraine or Ukraine's allies would have hoped. There have been reports that Ukrainian troops are making slow but some progress around Robotny. We know that the 82nd Separate Air Assault Brigade, the unit that was operating these Challenger tanks, was thrown into battle just over two weeks ago in the middle of August. They, they've been the fact that they were thrown into battle again was a sign of how seriously Ukraine was taking it. The fact that we've seen the challenges committed again, more proof of that main effort. The 82nd was initially supposed to be a strategic reserve to be held back to exploit any cracks in the lines as and when they appeared, but they've been deployed before those cracks have fully appeared in order to try and help Ukraine create them. It's been announced that North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un is going to travel to Russia to meet President Vladimir Putin. We have the world's most reviled leader meeting perhaps the world's most reclusive. Uh, certainly a meeting that will cause some disquiet in Kyiv. What does this mean? Well, it's proof that war is all about logistics. It's about the supply of military materiel, men and munitions. After a year and a half of conflict in Ukraine, both sides are running low on ammunition, weapons, and they are drawing in more and more soldiers to the fight to replace uh, the men and women who have been killed and injured. In many ways, this is similar to to every other major conflict throughout history. It's particularly comparable to perhaps to the First World War. In the opening phase of a conflict, both sides exhaust their stockpiles of ammunition. They're now in the second stage where they're looking to replace that ammunition. Now, there are two ways you can do that. You can buy that in from outside or you can ramp up your own domestic production. In Russia's case, it is trying to ramp up production. It is also trying to source ammunition from its allies around the world, in this instance, North Korea. Now, we know that Russia has already tried to source ammunition from North Korea. There were warnings from Western intelligence sources that there were shipments from North Korea trying to reach Russia with ammunition, and that we understand some of those shipments were intercepted or thwarted. What's also interesting is that the Korean peninsula may be emerging as a key area 
for weapons production in the strange interconnected way that the world is all linked. We know that Russia is now relying on Pyongyang for its ammunition and yet South Korea and Seoul has one of the largest and fastest and most capable weapons productions industrial bases which may well be used increasingly to supply Ukraine. Now, South Korea does not supply Ukraine directly at the moment, but it does supply Ukraine's allies and much of that ammunition is being passed on. So what we take from this is the importance of logistics and the importance of the Korean Peninsula. Ukraine's Defence Minister, Alexei Reznikov, has resigned at the request of President Zelensky. Now, this is the result of a number of simmering and long-running corruption scandals which have dogged military procurement uh, over the course of the last 18 months. Now, these have been cases of uh, the army overpaying for basic supplies, things like eggs. A uh, military contract emerged, Russia, uh, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense paying about twice the market rate for eggs. Uh, other suggestions of backhanders and deals being done through nepotistic channels. This has sort of gained traction in Ukraine as people have felt, you know, that, that the corruption, which has long been a part of life in Ukraine, is just unstomachable, given that so many of Ukraine's bravest and best are making the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives and their limbs on the front line. It's become politically impossible for Reznikov to stay in power, given these uh, lingering complaints over his tenure. Now, interestingly, President Zelensky has replaced him with the a Tatar executive, a Crimean official, Rustam Umarov, a name we'll be hearing more of. Uh, now, he is a um, he is a known anti-corruption activist. In many ways, he's uh, unpopular with some of Ukraine's members of parliament because he's taken such a hard line uh, on corruption in the past. What's interesting as well, especially for those abiding the Russian propaganda that Ukraine is a Nazi state, in fact, this makes Ukraine perhaps the first country in the world to have a Jewish president and a Muslim minister of defense. We'll talk briefly about what has happened to Wagner Group. It's nearly two weeks since a plane believed to be carrying Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner leader, crashed as a result of an explosion thought to have been caused by a bomb on board. Uh, it's thought that explosion also killed the co-founder of the Wagner Group, Dmitry Utkin. Now, this comes, of course, uh, after Prigozhin led a failed and botched mutiny, a charge on Moscow with his men amid long-running uh, disaffection and disquiet among him and his men, a, a fight with the Ministry of Defence over weapon supplies and blame and credit and claims for credit over who had been doing what in Ukraine. For the time being, it seems that Wagner as a force in the war in Ukraine is, is spent. It's no longer significant. But of course, there were Wagner fighters who moved to Belarus. And we know that Wagner maintained a significant global network, particularly across Africa. And they may well remain a force to be reckoned with, although exactly who leads them and in which direction they go remains to be seen. When Prigozhin was killed, there were warnings from Wagner loyalists that they would take revenge. So when when news of the plane crash in which we understand Prigozhin was killed first emerged, there were warnings from Prigozhin and Wagner loyalists that they would avenge his death. And finally, Daniel Burke, a British volunteer who went missing in August, remains missing in Ukraine. He was last seen in Zaporizhia. He is now missing, presumed dead. His family have accepted that uh, it, the circumstances of his disappearance are such that it seems increasingly unlikely that he will come back alive, uh, hoping against hope nonetheless, and hoping that Ukrainian investigators will continue to look into this case. A friend of Daniel Burke, Sam Newey, was also killed in action. Uh, since we last did an update, he was killed by a mortar strike in eastern Ukraine. A reminder of the toll that this war is taking, not just on the Ukrainians, but on the volunteers who've gone to join their fight. Right. Thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one today, uh, as winter approaches, what's happening to the Ukraine's nuclear power stations? Will Russia continue to use them as bases? Well, 
We understand that uh, Russian forces have occupied the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and there's no indication that that is going to change. Of course, other nuclear power plants still in uh, Ukrainian-held territory uh, remain operational uh, far from the front lines and trying to supply power. I think the broader question is as winter approaches, are we expecting Russia to step up once again its assault on Ukraine's energy infrastructure effectively to try and freeze the population to break their will to fight? There are warnings that that will happen again. Uh, there are warnings that it will be worse this winter than it was last winter. But nonetheless, we know that Ukrainian authorities, uh, civil society has been taking steps to try and mitigate uh, those attacks should they be repeated by the Kremlin this time round. Sam Wright asked whether cluster bombs can be used to clear uh, minefields. The short answer is no, it wouldn't be reliable enough to then send infanteers in or even to send vehicles into an area assuming that it had been cleared. Uh, the cluster bombs are really designed to be used against groups of people, against trenches or possibly larger ones to be used to sort of lay mines to be used against vehicles. But even cluster bombs have their own problems and risks, they have a dud rate. So if you're filling an area with cluster bombs, uh, whilst you would hope that all of them explode on a timed fuse, there is always a risk that some wouldn't and may then be motion activated when your own forces uh, move through. At the moment, it seems that the only way for Ukraine to clear these minefields is sort of painstakingly dangerous work, uh, often by hand. Um, occasionally you know, looking at other me methods as well, but primarily uh, difficult and dangerous work by hand under risk of uh, artillery bombardment from the Russians. And the third question was, can CRAMs be used to protect Ukrainian mine teams? So CRAMs is a type of uh, radar computer controlled gun uh, often used on ships uh, or, uh, to protect uh, an, a precious piece of infrastructure. So a, a radar would detect uh, incoming threats, uh, be they be mortars, uh, missiles or rocket artillery, and immediately direct the gun uh, to blast those threats out of the sky. I mean, in theory, that could work. Um, it comes, of course, with its own perils, which is that these uh, these weapons, the, the radars themselves can be detected. And once once those radars are in an area um, where they're broadcasting effectively, where they're emitting uh, radar signals, they can then uh, be subjected to incoming fire. And I think um, it's probably a question of uh, logistics and resources and whether or not uh, those resources are A, available uh, and B, um, deployable in, in such a force and in such a manner, uh, both quickly enough and in sufficient scale, at sufficient scale to protect uh, the people clearing the mines you know, for long enough in order to do it. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't been done yet. Uh, I'm certain that uh, the Ukrainian military will be looking at all sorts of options to try and protect their troops uh, as they do these, this really, really difficult and dangerous work uh, of clearing the mines. But in the meantime, uh, it appears that uh, Ukraine is falling back on its own artillery and relying on its artillery to try and suppress the Russian guns uh, to create those windows of opportunity for its teams to clear the mines. That's all. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do tune in next week. And as ever, if you have any questions, please write them in the comments below and we will do our best to answer them next time.